Um, so what I wanted to talk about today was um, ways in which we can try and improve the outcome for adults with autism, really across the board. Uh, I mean, you've just heard Tori talking from the um, aspect of, of someone with autism who's, who's very intelligent and has um, very um, high levels of skills in many areas. But of course, that doesn't apply to all people with autism. Although we do know now that actually many, many more people with autism have an IQ in the average range than used to be thought. It used to be thought that most children with autism also had intellectual disability. Whereas we know now that, um, in fact, the, the majority have an IQ in the normal range and therefore huge potential. So, um, so what I wanted to look at in uh, this talk was um, what happens to people in adulthood, what, what the uh, outlook is for them. What do we know about interventions that are particularly focused on adults? And also, what are, do we know anything about the long-term effects of very early interventions? And then I wanted to look briefly at ways that we might improve social inclusion and also mental health, because that's a, a problem for many adults. Uh, and then briefly um, to look at the question of uh, what's the impact of aging? Do people with autism age in the same way as the, the rest of us, or do they have actually um, better outcomes in that way? And then how we can uh, improve the future. I think that if you look at an awful lot of publicity about autism, it tends to, for the people who can see the screen, it tends to focus on the first two pictures. So very little, uh, so young infants or quite young children. There's much less focus on the latter pictures of people in middle um, age or older age. And, and clearly, uh, as was already said, people are adults with autism much longer than they are children with autism. So it's very important to focus on those latter pictures rather than only on the first two. So looking now at what we know about what happens in adulthood, and it's quite interesting if you go back and look at the literature um, written by Leo, people like Leo Kanner and Hans Asperger, uh, so that's 30 and more years ago. One of the things that both of them remarked on, and Kanner in particular, was how people change over time. Uh, and um, Kanner wrote that um, he uh, uh, was particularly curious about people who um, change substantially from what they look like in children. So some individuals uh, develop more problems as they grew older, but the, the vast majority of individuals made a, much more progress than um, he or other people would ever have thought. Uh, and so he described um, many people uh, amongst those he saw as, as moving from really very sort of um, dependent children to, to adults who had made at least superficially good social adjustment, even though they still had some difficulties of the, the sorts of nature that Tory was talking about. And actually, uh, sorry, go back. Um, Kanna himself, uh, Asperger, um, stressed that actually having a dash of autism can be really, really beneficial. Um, and that for real success, particularly in areas like science or some art areas, um, he felt that a dash of autism was actually absolutely necessary. And in fact, it's very clear from studies that have been done looking at the, um, how people move through childhood into adulthood that there's many positive aspects on an individual level. So most studies show that uh, the severity of autism symptoms diminishes. Um, so people become less repetitive and stereotyped in their behaviors or, or more able to control those behaviors, at least when they're in, in uh, public settings. That social interactions and social awareness increase and, and language also tends to improve. And just in terms of general behavior difficulties, generally they too improve. So at a, 
individual level, there's lots and lots of positive changes. The problem is that society really hasn't caught up with that. So the support mechanisms to really help people make the best use of these positive changes um, are, are really lacking in most situations. So what we see, uh, the negative aspects, are really social negative aspects. It's not the people with autism who've got the difficulties. It's the lack of society, uh, lack of um, society's ability to, to really meet the needs. So we see very low rates of social inclusion and employment. Um, so even if people are in work, they tend to be more in sheltered workshops or non-paying day activity centers. And what's particularly striking there is it's not that just they're doing um, less well than uh, people in the general population, they're doing less well than people with other disabilities. So less well than groups of people with intellectual disability or speech and language disorders or psychiatric disorders very often. And once people leave school, you find their, uh, their opportunities for adult day activities are much poorer than they used to be. And particularly for adults whose IQ is in the normal range, they're much less likely to have a well-structured day, um, daytime activity program than they had when they were at school. And these difficulties, once people leave school, they're not just a sort of short-term hiccup and things pick up later on. Uh, without help, these difficulties persist. And also um, related to that is very often you find an increase in mental health problems. And these tend to be mainly associated with anxiety and depression um, or things like um, obsessional compulsive disorders. So um, major psychiatric disorders like schizophrenia tend to be very low in or relatively low in this group. But the biggest problems are anxiety and depression. And these often emerge in mid to late teens and early adulthood and are actually very often related to environmental pressures. It's having to cope with college, trying to find jobs, leaving home and living independently, uh, and just a general lack of support. So they're the difficulties that tend to uh, emerge in adulthood. And I think if you look back at studies that have been done over the last few decades um, to see whether outcome generally has improved, um, we're not finding the sorts of um, changes that we should do. So, okay, people have a better life now than they did when Kanna was first describing pe older people with autism, many of whom just ended their lives in institutional care. Now, that, that's no longer the case, but if you still look at rates of inclusion in society, like opportunities for work and so forth, they're still poor, and that's despite the huge improvements that have happened in, in programs for, for young children. So, uh, turning now to the interventions that might be available to, to help adults. Um, in fact, despite the fact we all know there's been a big rise in diagnoses of autism, that first curve shows the rates of the numbers of people being diagnosed over the last sort of 30 years or so. Um, the numbers of studies on adults are still very, very low. So if you look at the second slide, um, the tallest bars indicate the number of studies that have been done on children with autism, and the smallest little black dots at the end indicate the numbers of studies that have been done on adults. So very little adult research. And actually, the quality of adult research, particularly intervention research, is, is pretty poor. It's nothing like the standard of these you know, big and expensive and successful intervention tr trials we have with children. And as was mentioned in, in the uh, earlier on, it's not as if people's brains stop developing. I mean, people's brains carry on developing um, at least into the 20s and, and well after that. But actually, if you look at uh, intervention research, um, most of the trials stop in the very earliest years, even though there's you know, uh, many, many years in the future 
uh, with opportunities uh, for inter successful intervention programs. And just, I'm not going to use make many references or statistics here, um, but I just wanted to point out a couple of reviews. So um, one uh, by a Canadian group, um, they looked at 11,000 studies of autism that were published in the first decade of, of this century, and only 23 out of 11,000 studies were on either interventions or services for adults. Uh, and another um, review, um, another American review, they um, found, they were looking at papers particularly on adults, and they found only 13 that were on interventions for adults that were of any sort of good quality. I mean, there are other studies out there, but they were simply poor quality. So you can see that both there's not much research on adults, and particularly in intervention research, what's there isn't terribly great. So there's a couple of big sort of systematic reviews over the last couple of uh, y few years, one by in the UK by what we call the uh, National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence, which reviews all sorts of treatments for all sorts of conditions. Um, and in that review, we looked at nearly uh, over nine and a half thousand studies of autism, and there was a similar review in the States at much the same time. And in the NICE um, review, um, we found very few well-conducted intervention trials, and so um, we were not able to recommend any specific treatment program that w was proven to improve communication or social functioning or ritualistic and stereotype sorts of problems in, in adults. Um, we didn't find uh, any evidence either for uh, more sort of alternative therapies like diets or vitamins or um, various other programs. In the end, with NICE, we, en uh, we, we found it was easier to tell people what not to do than what sort of things to try because the evidence was so poor. Uh, and one of the um, things that we particularly focused on was the use of pharmacological interventions to, to manage um, so-called challenging behaviours in autism. Uh, and um, the recommendation there was that drugs should not be used in adults to manage core autism symptoms or to manage behavioral problems. And actually, if you were finding behavioral difficulties, the first approach to intervention should be changing the person's environment or helping the, the uh, people in that environment to offer a more suitable um, in program for, uh, for adults with autism. Um, uh, and also to try psychological interventions such as CBT as well. And um, the other recommendation was that if in the end you did need medication, if these other things hadn't worked, it should only be prescribed by a specialist, it should be very regularly monitored, and you should discontinue that medication um, if it was clearly not working within six weeks. Now, I'm not sure what the situation is over here, but one of the problems we have, particularly in residential units for adults in the uh, UK, is if, if a medication doesn't work, you just give another medication on top of that one, and you just keep giving the same medication um, uh, over time. So, and certainly the evidence is once people start on medication, uh, they tend to stay on it. So one of the things I said that NICE wanted people's attitudes to, to change towards was just the use of medication when things became difficult. Um, Another big question is whether, okay, we, we haven't got much in the way of um, adult interventions that seem to work, but is there any evidence that if you have very early intervention, um, that makes a difference uh, when people are much older? Now, there are lots of claims for treatments for young children with autism. Um, some have got a good, you know, reasonably good evidence base behind them. Others are, are much um, more sort of uh, questionable, um, and some I think not to be recommended at all. So sending your child off to 
China for stem cell therapy or something like that is uh, not to be recommended uh, for a whole batch of reasons. Um, so there's lots and lots of claims, as I'm sure you know, on the internet for treatments for autism, um, some of which are, are better validated than others. Uh, and particularly, I think, um, these early programs that focus on parent-child relationships and communication uh, have got quite a good evidence base now, uh, and that's getting stronger. What we don't know, though, is whether these programs actually have an impact in, in the years to come. And, and sometimes you get claims such as um, being made for these very intensive um, uh, behavioral interventions, which are, these are these programs that uh, you last about, you have to do them for 40 hours a week, and you have to start when the children are very, very young, and they're also phenomenally expensive. Um, but claims there that if you do one of these very expensive treatments, that will save, you know, zillions of dollars um, across the rest of somebody's lifetime. But of course, they're quite spurious, those claims, because nobody's ever done uh, studies over people's lifetime. Uh, and most follow-up studies have just looked at the effects of treatment after a year or um, two years. Um, and the, the longest follow-up studies are really only about five to seven years. Um, and actually, when you look at those studies, it seems to be often it's the characteristics of the individuals themselves as much as or even more than the treatment that really seem to predict outcome. So we don't know really whether very early intervention has a long-term effect. Um, now, clearly early intervention is important and it needs to suit the families and the children involved. But I think no matter how good an early program is, if you only do it for a year or two years and then the children go into very substandard or not, uh, not specialist education thereafter, the chances that the effects are going to be maintained for decades later are, are pretty um, limited. If you put a, a, a typical child into a really good school program between the age of four and six and then do nothing special for them subsequently, that those early programs aren't going to make that much difference if the intervening years uh, provision is poor. So I think um, what I'm going to turn to now is what we know about um, the sorts of ways in which we might start about improving social integration uh, and both mental and mental health in adults because as I've said social integration is poor and often mental health is poor as well. One of the things I think that, that uh, was touched on again earlier was using people's special skills. Almost everybody's got certain things that they're better at than uh, than in others, and if you, a lot of focus in autism is what, on what people can't do, actually focusing on what they can do, and thinking about ways in which you can uh, really enhance those special areas of skill uh, can often uh, lead to um, much better outcomes as the years go on. And again, I just want to go back to Canna writing many years ago now. And he'd followed up uh, nearly 100 individuals into adulthood. And he was struck by um, just a small group of them at that time who'd done really, really well as adults. And um, he um, pointed out that what these people had done was get involved in groups where they'd, uh, they could make use of their special interests or their preoccupations um, as shared hobbies or shared skills in the company of other people. So they weren't just doing their, uh, you know, particular sort of um, practicing their particular skill by themselves. They got involved in groups where these skills were were valued or of use and added to the society. And, and that enabled them to earn recognition because of their detailed knowledge of certain topics, um, allowed them to mix more with other people. Uh, and he, he described it as uh, th this integration, this inclusion, 
meaning that, that actually life, particularly social life, lost um, it, what he described as its former menacing aspects. But they were using their skills to join in with other groups rather than just being expected to join in socially for the sake of it because that, that remains hard for most people. Um, and there's some nice, uh, been some nice um, examples recently uh, um, of some of the people who are still around that Canna diagnosed all those years ago. And um, this, this man called Donald Triplett, who's been described as autism's first child, because he was the first case that Canna actually described. Um, very disturbed as a child, needed, was in specialist residential provision for a while because his behaviours were so difficult. But as the years went on, he, he uh, um, got more help and, and made many improvements. Um, for a while, he was living with foster parents, and they helped develop his particular preoccupations in, into practically useful ways. And Kanna was writing, uh, when Kanna was writing about him, he was getting on for, he was mid-fit 30s. Uh, and at that time, um, he, um, even then, he was taking part in a variety of community activities. He lived in a very small town in the Midwest, um, but he, everybody knew him, everybody respected him. His chief hobby was playing golf, which he played a lot. And, you know, although he wasn't a professional, he'd won various trophies in, in uh, local competitions. And, and oh, about a year ago, a couple of journalists in the States went looking for Donald to see whether he was still around and what he was doing. And they found him still living in the same little town where he was born, still playing golf, still talking to the same people, using the same... He got certain phrases that he used over and over. Um, but he was um, still really part of the community um, and loved golf and loved Cadillac cars. He was, his big disappointment in life was there weren't so many Cadillacs around as they used to be. Um, but really, um, fitting very well into the local community. But actually, the local community also playing quite a role in, in welcoming him um, into and understanding him over the years. And actually, if you, you um, not everybody's got the skills that, that Donald had, um, but if you, some research showing that a significant proportion of people with autism um, have got what are these, we call these so called savant skills, particular areas in which they're at least as good at or better than other people. One of the problems is um, that. Um, most people aren't helped to make best use of these skills. Um, there's quite a nice little booklet called, which is, I think, is nice for adolescents. It's called Different Like Me. Uh, so it's for adolescents with Asperger's syndrome or high functioning autism. And it, it describes all sorts of people who have done extremely well in their lives, either um, people who are still alive, people like Temple Grandin and so forth, or people in the past who may. It's always dubious to know, but uh, whether they, they may have had autism or certainly had a good touch of autism, who've, who've actually had a huge impact on other people's lives subsequently. People like Newton and Einstein are amongst the, the people who are said to at least have a, a fairly good touch of autism, if nothing else. Um, but I think one of the big questions now is how we can both identify and make use of special skills, because I think we're just failing to do that for many people. Most people who've really um, been able to use their special skills have done it through their own sort of efforts, um, rather than actually having been helped by other people. Uh, and just as an example as that, you, I don't know if everybody can see the picture at the bottom, but that was um, uh, the case of a young man in the UK who was fascinated with computers, was brilliant at computers at school, um, but when he left school, couldn't find a job in computing, and he got involved in one of these hackers groups. You know, they were looking for aliens and uh, trying to break into, hack into people's com um, systems all over the world. 
and he managed to hack into the Pentagon's computer system um, using one of these old-fashioned dial-up modem connections, I think. So, you know, absolutely impossible to do, but he did it. And the Americans, instead of, you know, hiring him instantly on the spot, uh, demanded that he be extradited from the UK for spying. Um, and so that was about a two-year battle in, uh, in the legal system in the UK to stop him being sent to the, UK, uh, to the US, where he'd probably just have been banged up in prison for heaven knows how, and it, that would have destroyed him. But it was a, just a good example of somebody who'd got fantastic skills, but he'd never been given the support to, to use them. And they got him into really, really deep trouble. It got the British government into quite a lot of trouble as well. Um, okay. So we, um, I think looking at job prospects is a huge challenge and I know it's already been mentioned and there are more talks later on today um, about that. And again, just going back to the people who first wrote about autism, um, Asperger talking about people in work, um, focusing on how good the performance of somebody with autism in the workplace could be. And once you're in work and you're doing well in work and people respect you for that, then that brings with it social integration and social respect. Um, so um, really very important part of people's lives. But actually very few people make it into well-paid or appropriate employment. And um, some of the follow-up studies we have done or other people have done show that actually in terms of people in well-paid, professional, skilled work, you're probably only talking about 15, 20% of people. You get more people in unskilled um, or, uh, manual jobs and more people in, in sheltered or voluntary work. But that still leaves around 40, 50% of individuals who don't have any uh, real um, uh, employment, uh, even of a sheltered or voluntary kind. Um, and there is actually good evidence for the effectiveness of supported employment schemes that are especially focused on the skills and the social difficulties of people with autism. So you find there are improvements in people finding jobs and more importantly keeping jobs. Because one of the big problems with particularly um, very able people with autism, they'll often um, find work because their CVs look very good in terms of the qualifications they've got. They get a job, but then often lose that job quite quickly thereafter. Not because they can't do the, the job itself, but because of the social demands that the job brings with it. Um, but with the specialist supported schemes, you find these are uh, very beneficial both to the people with, with autism and their employers. And actually, they're very cost effective in terms of society as a whole because you've got people off benefits, they're paying taxes, they're living more independently and so forth. And um, so, again, sorry, it slipped down the bottom, but we did a supported employment scheme some years ago and found that um, the vast majority of people, we were able to get into um, technical types of jobs. Not everybody was suited to that because we had a range of people with different intellectual levels. Um, but <coughs> we found jobs appropriate to people's ability uh, and um, often they, these were sort of highly technical jobs as well. Uh, using the sort of um, obsessionality for detail um, that often people who don't have autism just haven't got. So, uh, you know, being very particular about details, doing things in exactly the, uh, the correct ways, um, and being able to focus uh, down on the, on the core um, issues in a, in a job was, was something that was particularly, um, that particularly belonged to the skills of people with autism. Um, in, in the NICE um, evaluation as well, um, we couldn't say 
um, as I said, that things were definitely going to work, but it looked like if you'd got good leisure activity programs and social learning programs, these seemed to be of benefit for people with autism as well. So well, one of the things NICE was recommending was that these needed to be evaluated more. But I think if you, um, as I say, that there's indications that social skills programs may be beneficial, but I think if they're really going to work, they need to uh, start much earlier. A lot of social skills programs that are done start in adolescence. A lot of them aren't real life programs as well. So there's lots of um, computer analog types of, of programs, virtual reality programs, there's programs using robot, robots and all sorts of things. All you know, technically really exciting and certainly showing that people, uh, young children, adolescents, can make progress in these types of situations. What we haven't got is evidence that it makes them function better in the playground or that they're, better fo uh, they're functioning better in school and college and so forth. So a lot of promise there, but I think we need to start earlier and they need to be in more real life settings as well. Um, in terms of mental health problems, looking at how we might sort of improve those, um, there's more work on cognitive behaviour therapy, um, which um, has, seems to work well with non-autism groups, with ad uh, particularly with depression and anxiety. Uh, and there's been a number of trials with people with autism as well. Um, but the effects are variable and often these aren't people who've got really, really severe uh, mental health problems. They're people who score high on ratings of anxiety, but not necessarily people who are in clinics, uh, attending clinics for anxiety or depression. And also, these programs are very complex. They involve all sorts of different types of skills and, and uh, strategies. And we don't know which of those are, m are more important, uh, which are the, the crucial ingredients, really. So for example, um, there was one recent study, and they looked at a program of CBT, and they compared it with a recreational activity program where people went out and did things in groups, they did things together, they were using the you know, local facilities much more. And actually both groups um, uh, reported better quality of life after the treatment finished. Um, in neither group did psychiatric symptoms as rated by professionals seem to improve, but people themselves described their mental states as being better. Um, and it may be that, you know, it, the, what CBT does is, is uh, it gives you structure. Often CBT is done in groups as well. And it may, may be those elements that are important rather than the, um, the you know, the, 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 the cognitive behavioral elements particularly. Uh, so there's lots of things to be explored as to what are the really important ingredients for improving people's mental health. Um, and of course, you know, if you think about CBT, which is all about people trying to change the way they think about themselves and, and the world and so forth, that can be jolly difficult for some people with autism um, because, you know, problems of... Um, Thinking about your feelings, um, being able to visualize what the world's like from other people's points of view can be very difficult. So there's a whole range of reasons why the traditional CBT therapy may be hard for people with autism to, um, to respond to. And ways of adapting it so it's more autism specific is something that we really need to be thinking about. So, and the research that's done, been done on children looking at CBT suggests that before you start a CBT program, you need specifically to address the um, autism symptoms. So you need to try and work on the social and communication problems and the rather ritualistic and stereotype thought patterns or any other behavior problems before you start CBT to uh, focusing on, on anxiety and so forth. But I think the other big thing you need to bear in mind that it's no good having a, pro a program that you sit 
you go to every week and you sit and talk to a psychiatrist or a psychologist with or without another group of people if the environment you're going back to is still as stressful and as inappropriate as, as it ever was. So I think um, what you need to do is try and change the environment um, rather than only focusing on the people with autism because if you've got severe depression and anxiety because of the situation you're living in, um, anxiety isn't going to improve um, if life continues to be really threatening and, um, and uh, stressful or isolated. Just wanted to look very briefly at the impact of aging and what happens to people who are at this stage in life um, because we know very little uh, about that. And there's all sorts of questions there that still remain to be answered. So, for example, compared with typical aging, do people with autism deteriorate faster and more globally? Uh, do they show the same patterns of decline as, you know, the, the rest of us do once we reach a certain age? Or actually, do they show areas of relative strength? Are there things about autism, the special areas, things like memory, for example, um, that uh, remain um, more intact than they do in the general population. And in fact, there's been some suggestion that um, there may be something about the brains of people with autism that may have a protective um, effect um, uh, from dementia. Well, we really don't know that, and that's a whole area of research that needs to be looked at. Um, but one of the problems there, as I pointed out before, the, num the amount of research at the moment on older people is absolutely tiny. That's starting to change, and I think that, that's, a good, um, uh, that's a good move forwards, but we've still got a huge long way to go before we get to the level either of the quality or the quantity of studies that have been done on children. So just, uh, just finally, how, how can we Im help to uh, um, improve the future uh, for adults, and particularly older adults with, uh, with autism? Well, the National Autistic Society in the UK has recently had a campaign just pointing out to the world that adults with autism exist. Autism doesn't disappear when people reach 16 or 19. There's an awful lot of people out there um, who've got... Um, autism who are adults and they need help just as much as children. Um, the, uh, um, so far, as I say, there's, there's very little evidence that, um, that of more deterioration in older adults with autism than in the general population. But what we do know is that quality of life is often poor and Christopher Gilberg, for example, has suggested that we, we need to get rid of the, um, or dispense to some extent anyway, the traditional ideas of, of what makes a good life. So, you know, we all think a good life is having a job, it's, it's having a partner, it's having a family, having lots of friends and so forth. But actually, for lots of people with autism, they may or may not want some or all of those things. You know, being having um, things that usefully fill their time is important, but whether that's a paid job may not be right for everybody. Some people just do not want friends. They can cope very well. They want to be accepted by society, but they don't want to have, they don't want just to chat for the sake of it because they think that's a bit of a rubbishy waste of time. So it, I think it is very important that we don't impose our notions of what's a good life on, on other people. And, and so and Christopher Gilberg, for example, suggested what we need to be doing is um, thinking about what makes an autism-friendly environment. Um, and amongst the things he's focused on are having people who know about autism and proper training for people who are working with people with autism. People need structured and individualized programs. And that, you know, individualized means it's going to be different for e each person. And you need occupations or everyday life activities that are appropriate to uh, people's level of capacity. So, okay, some people may be out there doing amazing sort of computer programming and uh, types of jobs, 
but for others, um, that, that may not be what they need. Uh, and um, Julie Lowndes-Taylor and other people have made the point that what you need is this fit between the person and their environment, um, not to inflict this... Uh, or expect that everybody should have the same environment or that that environment should be what uh, non-autistic people think is a, a good thing. So I think that we, we really need to focus now on improving the quality of adult provision. Uh, certainly in the UK, the support that adults get tends to be very expensive simply because it's crisis management based. They don't get uh, regular help, but if things go wrong, then everybody panics and throws money and uh, expensive services at the problem. Um, support also tends to be very uncoordinated or just it's totally non-existent. So um, often the support people get is from their families and of course as individuals with autism get older, their, their parents are older as well and increasingly less able to cope or increasingly worried about what the future will hold when they're no longer around. Um, oh, we have the situation in the, in the UK, for example, where there's a, been a huge move to get everybody into work, that they, the government claiming that anybody on disability benefits is probably just a scrounger. And, you know, and if you're not clearly physically incapacitated, you should be out there um, working so that, uh, you know, parents are coming under a lot of threats um, in that way that, you know, what, why are you supporting the child, at, your son at home, he's perfectly fit and able to go out and work, even though that's clearly, he might be physically fit, but the supports to um, make him or her able to uh, function in the workplace simply aren't there. So I think that, just to summarise, we mu need much greater awareness and training of people in health and social and em employment settings about the needs and the risks and the difficulties of individuals with autism, um, but also the skills and the potential benefits of people with autism, um, not just those who are more able, but, but across the range. And I think improving the environment and the understanding of the people in it is just as important, if not more so, than just trying to change the person with autism. Um, so we need individualized care plans. Um, sometimes care may need to be only, you know, really quite uh, low intensity, low cost um, and intermittent. But it needs to be there in the background. So if problems start to arise, you can get in and give help uh, early on rather than waiting for some crisis. Um, we certainly need to reduce the sort of psychological pressures on, on elderly parents or siblings who, you know, and, uh, getting no obvious support um, uh, themselves. And I think we need to encourage as much as possible local community support um, and understanding and inclusion as well. And I think we also need to improve um, the quality of research as well. Um, Michelle Dawson, who's a, um, a woman with autism working in Canada, um, she's picked up on the fact that a lot of research on adults with autism is very poor quality, very poor standard. And she's, she argues that, you know, this sort of bad science just reflects an attitude of disrespect towards people with autism. And she's made the point that autist, people with autism deserve better, both in terms of services, but also in terms of, of the research programs um, that, that should be developed to help them. So thank you for listening. Thank you very much. That was excellent. I'm sure we have time for some questions. And uh, people standing in the back, it's good to stand up, but there are seats for you up front here. So don't be worried. There's a whole row there if you want to sit down. I'm sure we can take a couple of questions. And I'm happy to repeat the question so anyone can hear. Anyone want to start with a question? It was crystal clear, Pat. That's fantastic, isn't it? Yes, please. Yeah. 
So the question is, in UK, what, what have you found been incredibly successful in supporting uh, uh, adults with autism into employment? In terms of employment, did you say? Um, it's working a lot with the companies. I noticed here you were talking about big co going for big companies often, and that's one of the things we did as well. We went for big companies because we found if we had a successful placement, then um, you know word would get around that actually employing somebody with autism was a really good thing for the company. You're not just doing it out of charity. But what we would do, we had very detailed assessments of the people's own skills and, and difficulties. We, um, when we found a placement for them, they would go into the job with a support worker. Now, the support workers often couldn't do the job, because some of them were really you know, very uh, complicated computing jobs or, sci or you know, um, biochemistry or, or chemistry, that sort of thing. So often the support workers couldn't do the job because it was above their level of understanding. But the support workers understood the social difficulties of the people with autism. So they could help deal with those social difficulties. Well, a lot of um, instructions for employers and for uh, managers, uh, things like giving people direct feedback, so telling them exactly what they needed to do, how much of it they needed to do, if people made mistakes or weren't doing things correctly, or that they were infringing certain social skills, you told them straight away. You ha really helping people to be very honest and direct in their feedback was one of the most important things. And because on the whole, you know, if things go wrong in the workplace, people don't give you instant feedback. They, they gossip about you or they mutter behind your back or they wait till things have got really difficult before suddenly they start yelling and screaming. But instant feedback and direct feedback from colleagues or from managers was one of the uh, most important things. And then we gradually faded out the amount of time the support worker was there. So probably for the first month they were in the job, almost full time, and then it was just uh, down to a few hours a week. And then often they wouldn't be there at all, but they'd be available on the phone, either to the person with autism or to people in the workplace if, if there were difficulties. So, um, so it's quite expensive to begin with in the first month or so couple of months it's an expensive process but then the costs come right down and and certainly studies in in the US on people employed special employment for people with disabilities generally show that after about two or three years the it, the costs become um, minimal and you start to get a payback in terms of you know tax, no benefits and higher taxation and so forth